Perfect. Um, well, I can give you a quick little rundown. I don't know how much, how much do you know? Just from Randy sort of making contact with you? Uh, what I know is that it's probably a safety issue. It involves, part of it is, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what I, that's I know. Yeah. Um, so it really started as a grassroots program up in Renfrew County and with their, with their emergency medical service there. So it started there probably about five years ago with um, medics who have been long-term residents in the community and just on their downtime, so between calls on the road, would just on their own stop by and see people and just um, people they knew that were living alone, people they knew that were recently discharged from the hospital, that sort of thing, just stop in, check on them, see how they were doing, monitor them, check vitals, that sort of thing. And they were, there was just a couple of them really just doing it kind of out of the goodness of their hearts. Um, it wasn't anything um, that was in place by the service. And what they ended up seeing was that um, there are calls amongst frequent users, so people that often, you know, activate the 911 system and end up in emergency. They actually saw those calls go down. So say you had someone calling on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, it was almost like these paramedics were providing a little bit of reassurance or catching problems before they turned into a crisis. So that's sort of where it started because how much money does it cost to, to get picked up and go to go to the hospital? Two hundred and sixty yeah, dollars. Sure the numbers are once you start involving the hospital and the staff there, that's, and it's uh, it adds and up. the numbers are, are, are quite high, and, and often uh, it's just people want reassurance that they're okay. Mm -hmm. and, and you know they wonder about their blood pressure they wonder about their blood sugar they wonder yes. am I okay today and or often I noticed uh, uh, we've been at this what now what a month, two months January 19th is when we started a few months um, I've noticed uh, one of the issues that uh, arises over and over is isolation um. amongst amongst the people we see um, which uh, spurs um, Worthlessness, you know, hopelessness, mm -hmm. and it leads into mobility issues. Because if, if you don't, if you feel worthless, you're not moving, you're not up, and you're not about. A lot of times I'll go in and I'll try and, everybody's got a history. Yeah. Everybody. You have to convince them and you actually have to be interested in, uh, in what these people have to say and convince them that you're interested. Um, and once they start, talking to you and sharing stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like you, you, you go in, you have a gentleman who's maybe in his early 90s, or maybe he played lacrosse, mm -hmm. you know, um, 70 years ago, you know, and you start hitting on to it's topics like that, and you draw, uh, they start talking about it, and they seem to just bubble up and, mm -hmm. and, and really, uh, start to Somebody start. We, yeah, exactly. And 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 all of a sudden, they seem to um, you know, install hope in them. Um, somebody's interested in. They're not worthless. Uh, and we want to see them again. So it gives them something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. And and at that second, like, I've seen people just like you know just just bubble up and. Um, and really look forward to the next visit. It gives them something to look forward to. You always need hope, mm -hmm. and that's uh, if you're living with worthlessness, oh, you have no hope. Yeah. You're, you it's fall true. into isolation, and uh, and it, it leads into mobility issues, and and generates a lot of calls for us. Mm -hmm. So if you can just if if somebody's going to look forward to a visit, you know, oftentimes it becomes a social. You know, it's a wellness check. We do wellness checks. We we're, we're going to do your, your vital signs, your blood pressure, your, your pulse, your oxygen set, your, your blood sugar. We'll do all that. We'll do ECGs if we need to. Mm -hmm. um, but I it's like, really, the program is very client-based. It's very client-driven. <clears throat> we can't say, you know, exactly here's the list of things that we do. It's really, uh, you know, Randy will say the patient directs the conversation, the patient directs the visit, and... and what we can do for them and it could be identifying a number of issues it could be identifying that they have severe depression or and it's amazing what people will share they they really open up and 
Um, you know, we've connected people with um, mental health counseling at the hospital that, you know, they've, they've really come a long way just in the past couple months. And it's, it's just, they're not able to reach out on their own and they just need someone to help direct them to the right place. And so we've been able to do that. We've connected with local doctors, you know, some people need medication adjustments. Um, some people need help with just being compliant with their medications. Um, you know, that's, that's one thing. There's one person that we we saw right from the very beginning and he hasn't had a single call to a single call to 911 hasn't been an emerge, nothing. And he was going on a weekly basis. And it's just now that we're kind of on him about taking his meds properly and, um, it can really vary. Um, and like Granny said, isolation, people adjusting to their partner being placed in, in houses and then all of a sudden trying to figure out how to be alone and there's fear that goes with that and that sort of thing. Um, it, yeah, it really varies and we're working a lot with a lot of different community agencies, um, like the crisis team, mental health, Sea uh, Bay Valley Community Health Center. So. We're drawing uh, elder abuse, another thing, like we're drawing from a lot of um, different places and building those partnerships. So, um, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. There's a lot of variety. A bit of the social work, a little bit of medical. And yeah, exactly. Why do you think, um, uh, it's interesting though that it's become uh, something that you're doing, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely, yeah. Because you're able to to do both things, to be a social worker in a way, as you say, care about the isolation, the work for less. Uh, people I know from, you know, medical problems, but also things such as um, losing their spouse, having to move out of their home, maybe going into a small uh, little senior's apartment or whatever. These changes are very difficult mm -hmm. and bring about the work for less, as you're saying. One of my friends is uh, uh, just she just retired. She spent a lot of time in a nursing home, and she said one of the, the worst problems they have to deal with is this feeling of worthlessness. Mm -hmm. Especially when they come in, some of them are in very bad shape. So it sounds as if to me, uh, this very bad shape may be prevented by what you're doing, so that when the time comes and they do have to go in a nursing home, they won't be in such bad shape when they get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're really trying to keep people, really ideally people don't want to leave their home. Most people, I would say, they want to stay in their home, they want to re re retain a little bit of independence in their life, and if we can sort of prolong that and make sure that they're safe and prevent any of these crises, I guess, then that's what we're trying to do. Um, is there anything you want to add? Well, to go back to why is, as it become the paramedics, um, I mean, we, a lot of people offer the same or very similar uh, programs. Uh, but I think one thing that helps us to do these things is we're, we're not experts in all those fields, but we're very good at assessing and picking out uh, details. Uh, yeah. And because we go in the people's home, we notice a lot. And that's what we do every, like, uh, every time we go in a house uh, to do a call as paramedics. Um, we're in and out quickly, but we pick out a lot of stuff okay. in, yeah. in that 10 minutes that we're in the patient's uh, home. And we just become really good at uh, picking out uh, details and assessment. And uh, so we can see and then help direct those people uh, to the appropriate channel. Like we, we're not the psychiatrists and we are not the, uh, you know, so we, we will, but we will connect them to the appropriate uh, uh, channels Service. or, uh, yeah, services. It sounds to me like it's really good uh, health prevention, you know. Uh, they're talking about that all the time, uh, what we can do to prevent things. So, as you say, if you're seeing these details and you, and you see maybe, uh, I can think of one particular person right now living in a very small apartment has so many things in it that I don't know how she hasn't broken her neck, just maneuvering around, and she's a stroke a survivor, so she's a big worry for me, you know, and you would probably see that right away and probably, you know, have some recommendations, why don't you get rid of some of this furniture or something, 
or put it in a way that her path is not and I think after a while when we build relationships and a little bit of trust, trust yeah. that they, they do start to open up and, and listen to, to any sort of suggestions that you have and I have uh, some, a couple of people did uh, uh, say to me they thought maybe it's duplication of services but I can see it certainly isn't yeah, and people do bring that up, you know, and these guys were too worried at the beginning, you know, well, are we, are we stepping on anyone's toes or, and, but really right from the beginning um, when we started and they'd come back at the end of their shift or whatever and they say, you know, I feel like I have a place. I feel like we have a place where we have something unique to offer. And I think the biggest thing too is that we're taking the time. We're taking the time to, and I don't want to say no one, you know, other services aren't taking the time, but, um, you know, if you're there to, change a pick line or you're there to do foot care, you know, that that's the specific job where we're trying to see it in a more holistic way. You know, what is their home environment like? What is their family support like? And, that, you know, and on from there, what's their medical history and that sort of thing. Yeah, and those things are all, all part of who the person is, as Randy said, mm -hmm. they all have a history. Yeah. Uh, where's the funding coming from now? Uh, Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. Ministry of Health. So it's not only Cornwall, it's um, for Cornwall and SVNG. There's 30 communities across Ontario that are all implementing this same program. Um, so like I said, it was based out of Renfrew and how successful it was sort of um, justified the funding um, for these programs across the province. Um, there was, I wasn't given any set plan on how to, you know, implement this or design it or anything like that. Every Every area of the province, every service has their own challenges, whether it's geographical or, uh, de you know, the demographics of the population. So in Eastern Ontario, we have a higher percentage of, of elderly than in a lot of other areas. Um, we're not as urban, that, that sort of thing. And so um, we can use the funds kind of at our own discretion and how we think is uh, most fit. So, That's good. yeah, so the funding does, uh, it's, guaranteed or it, it lasts I guess for a year so we're, this program will run until October 31st um, but from then we'll have to seek different sources of funding so whether or not that's through the LIN brought down to a more local level I'm, I'm not sure that's that is probably the best option um, I don't think it will come out of the ministry in Toronto but um, we'll see directly. The funds are there for a lot of things. Eh? Yeah exactly. Yeah. Yep. And so, really, we have to. Um, I think we have to rely both on qualitative and quantitative da data. Um, we know that the qualitative part is there. You know, when people say how much they enjoy the visits or just the few success stories that we've had so far, but we have to be able to show that the real target is being able to reduce emergency visits and nine one one activation because. Our call volume is increasing in our service itself, and, and it costs a lot of money to put a new ambulance on the road. So, exactly. um, we can target these people who are—I don't want to say burdening the system, but you know what I mean. They're—they are frequent users. Um, and the more frightful you are, you know, uh, somebody gets uh, symptoms. Oh my goodness, my blood pressure. I have a headache. I'm going to have a stroke. You know, one thing leads to the other. Um, and so they're more likely to call. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people don't know who else to call, right? Yeah. And yeah. that's true. It's also another good thing too is that because we're working with some doctors and a lot of the patients we see, I don't know what would you guys say, ninety percent are home, at least homebound or have really low mobility, and so people aren't able to get to their doctors on their own very easily. And so that's another reason. Well, I'll call nine one one, and I'll be seen and emerge like that. Yes. And home I go. So at least this way we can provide those in-home assessments and give that information to their doctor. And they can, at least that's a way of monitoring them on a regular basis. So. Yeah, transportation is an issue again yeah, with, yeah. The, with the isolation. A lot of people are homebound. Yeah, when, this winter particularly was quite difficult on a lot of people. It was, yes. it was. Um, so I mean if we can even change the quality of their life that way a little bit. you know. And we were talking earlier about people going from their homes uh, to, say, a retirement uh, mm -hmm. facility. Um, a lot of them resisted. Um, it's a change of life, you know. And people resist changes, and it's a it's, it's a stage of life. And people don't like to progress from from one stage of life to the next. And 
Because it's, it's, it's intimidating, you know, and there's a, it's worrisome going from your own home to uh, uh, a higher care environment. So you, yeah. you feel like you're uh, losing, losing their independence, the but they actually, they've isolated themselves. And the independence that they're looking for, they've actually eliminated. You know, so. well, I, I know. And this is a progression. I mean, it's, it's like a hoarder. I mean, it's, it's, it's a slow, or addictions, it's a slow progression over, over a long time. And sometimes when we go in, Pascal um, made mention to that uh, we're, we assess and we're quite observant. So we'll, we'll take a, I know it's, whether we consciously do it or not, we're taking an inventory of, of their environment. And that we can relate back to them. And they may not even be aware that oh, they're, they're sure. hoarding or mm -hmm. there are issues uh, uh, contributing to their, to why they're, they're accessing 911 and, uh, and other medical uh, people. So we can, we're, we're kind of like a mirror for them. Yeah, I, I bet you it's very comforting for them to have you come in too. It's a very non-judgmental yeah. um, They know your interests. Approach. Yeah. We don't, uh, you know, yeah. we don't pass judgment on it. You're going See, to be also very sure of them there. And, oh, absolutely, and that, yeah. that's huge. That, that's comforting, even for the caretaker. Yes. Or the caregiver. Right. Well, because caregiver, caretaker is different. But <laughs> they, that sometimes they're one and the same. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's very, very reassuring. Yeah. I'm sure. Especially if you think you're going to have a stroke and then you realize, you know, uh, um, what if you take the blood pressure and no, it's just fine. No, so. Okay. <laughs> also educating them in uh, the signs and symptoms of different uh, sure. uh, when illnesses to call, when, when or to call disease, 9 -1 -1. yes. Mm -hmm. So then they, they know when to call or maybe when, you know, they can hold back. Some people, uh, I've heard, I've heard, I don't know, um, they'll, uh, you know, they're not feeling well or something, but they know that if they uh, go to the hospital in an ambulance, they're going to get that's a myth. Oh, absolutely. It's yeah. a myth. You know? It's a myth. Seriously, <laughs> everybody gets <laughs> everybody gets triaged and then prioritized yeah. by the hospital. Exactly. The hospital yeah. decides where you're going to go after that initial uh, triage. Yeah. We triage the same as somebody yeah. walking in off the street with, with triage. And then but they prioritize. They, they, they think they'll get seen that day as opposed to, oh, I have to wait three weeks to see my doctor. Oh, something yeah, like that, right? Sure. But sometimes, you know, there's some people where waiting and emerge for that long is that's sort of detrimental to yeah. them, you know? It's it's a long time. It's, yeah. yeah, it's a long time. Yeah. It also uh, tells them that the next time that they don't feel well, they will do it, you know? Well, well yeah, absolutely. Know, absolutely. Sitting there for eight hours. I know people have walked out. Oh, yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, this is certainly wonderful. I don't like the idea, though, that you, you, you're going to lose your penny in October, but you can... Do you have money for us? <laughs> you know what? I mean, a anything that, that uh, you, you care enough about and, and you think holds value, you're going to invest in it. And that's what we're doing right now. We're going to invest in it. We're going to make it work. You know, we have to convince... Um, Somebody. Somebody. <laughs> somebody, <laughs> with, somebody with money. <laughs> that this is this is worthwhile. So I mean that's that's, that's that's the stage we're at. Yes. Now I'm hoping that the province looked uh, look look beyond the pilot project. You know I ho I'm hoping they just didn't dump money across the province and figured there there was going to be an end, uh, beginning and an end to this pro project without looking beyond it. And and having something in place but that, that's going to facilitate uh, us well, to continue. For example. Uh, one hip fracture cost the government approximately four hundred thousand oh, dollars to care for that person. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we can, uh, like one hip fracture, how do you how do you save that? Well, being safer in the house, and you know maybe having those people alter, make a few alteration, it might prevent them from uh, falling. Uh, cleaning up a little bit, like pathways, like we said. You have uh, your oxygen cord laying all around. That's there. right. <laughs> Education and, you know, uh, help guide those people to get the appropriate help and, you know, make the changes in the house. And I mean, it's just, hard to evaluate, you know, where did we prevent or did we not prevent? Yeah, that is that is very hard to know. But, um, you know, as simple as someone not 
be able to get groceries and not be able to uh, to get the proper nutrition. Well, eventually those people we will uh, get sick, yes. get weak, and uh, end up in the hospital. So if we can point them in the right direction, get them hooked up with Meals on Wheels, uh, with maybe taxi services where they can go out once a week or once every two weeks to go out and get the appropriate food um, right there. I mean, it's bound to make a difference. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I just wrote Dr. Sinha, he's a gerontologist in Toronto about some of these issues, especially the very basic things of nutrition, because of that, that can, you know, lead to all kinds of other medical problems just, just from that alone. And, um, but then, you know, how to get the funding, and that's a good thing. Oh, yeah. A friend of mine oh, was need, very needing glasses. She's walking in front of the courthouse. And she was being very, very careful because the sidewalk was uneven. And, and she was so busy watching that that um, she didn't see a pole. Mm. And she was that far from the pole, apparently, when this guy grabbed her. She would have fallen right out in front of all those buses on top. Imagine what that would have cost the Minister of Health. Mm -hmm. Well, and her quality of her, life. And, yeah. Her life and, and everything. Uh, you know, could kill her, you know, the shock and everything. So, yeah, the funding is a big issue. Well, but I'm this is exciting. Yeah. I'm hoping that it will be like a, you know, a money shift kind of thing. If we can save on these things and have the government save money on caring for, for illnesses or injuries that could have been prevented, well, maybe then we have uh, money for prevention. And I know it's, it's complex. And it's not that easy, but uh, that's what I'm kind of foreseeing. But there is a big shift overall, too, from treatment now to the preventative side, because preventative medicine is a, oh, is a lot more affordable than the treatment side, right? Exactly. So. That's right. Yeah. Mm. This is uh, just going to be a wonderful thing. Um, certainly no duplication of services when you see all the prevention that's being done here. It's not like... You know, somebody is not well, and uh, uh, a nurse comes in, takes blood pressure, and leaves, and the person still, you know, I mean, uh, that's that's wonderful that that's being done. But as you say, you do a little bit more than that. You also assess what's going on with this person, mm -hmm. even uh, their emotional level. Well, well, that brings that on a lot right. of, of of problems when people are affected by mental illness. Often they go to the hospital for, so they say, another reason. But in the end, if you kind of, you know, assess the situation, it's that mental illness problem that brings on a whole lot of other physical uh, distress. Uh, distress and, yes. yes. Well, it's yeah. almost like you guys kind of dig around for the root problem a lot of the time, too, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, that's a good point. And even like, or just trying to get to the bottom of, you know, you don't want to flat out say to someone, why do you call 911 all the time? But, you know, I do. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, Randy's an exception. But, you know, if it's, well, I, I know I fall in the bathroom every time. I, that is why I call. And it's like, okay, well, you don't have a grab, or, or I, I always fall getting out of bed, or whatever. And it's because I grab on to this specific spot, and that's not safe. It's, Okay, well, you look into then, you know, are these people on fixed incomes? Okay, what, you know, what can they afford? Can they afford something on their own that, can they get a grab bar installed? And that right, in right. itself, you know, because people can sometimes identify what the issue is, but there's just nothing been done about it. So. Many uh, tight for a lot of things right now. Exactly. And sometimes people just people don't know where to turn. Yeah. 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 Or the community, I understand too. Um, it is, it's totally self-directed, though, like, as far, and we refer to them as clients, not patients. But, and, the clients? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're yeah. a client, not yeah. a, not so a patient. Yeah, so it's friendly? Yeah. I guess, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, people are allowed to be as sick as they, they, they like. You have a right to be sick. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you're probably not responsible. That's what the definition of sick is, is removing responsibility. But you're not responsible for becoming sick, but you're responsible for your treatment. And now we're going in and we're trying to identify what uh, what treatment uh, avenues are available to them. We we'll present them to them, and then uh, absolutely, it's up to uh, 
it's up to the client to decide. It's dictated by them what to, what direction it's going to move in. I, I can think of two things. Like number one, how do you get those clients? I mean, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, and the other thing is, um, uh, once you get them, uh, and and maybe you need to refer them. Would would they would they resent that? It's possible. Um, but again, it's up to them. There's no. Uh, we're not forcing anything on anybody. Yeah. It's totally, totally their decision. And I mean, we clear everything with them. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we, we look for consent. That's, yeah, uh, some people request something. To even be there, you know what I mean? Uh, when I show up in uniform, um, they might be under the impression that they have to let me in, or they have to see uh -huh. me. Um, they don't. And we and we present that and and, and describe that immediately and, and look for their for their consent and we explain why you're there and it's, it's all put back on them. It's, it's up to them uh, what they want to do with it. Is this referral kind of thing? It is. We've got it through referral. There's a lot of we've, different sources. Yeah, yeah like um, one way we've done it, it was a little bit difficult to, to start up because you know the people are out there but yes. how do you reach out to them? So yeah. um, we started by having a, a referral system within our own service. So okay. say, you know, Pascal is on the road, meaning she's in the ambulance doing regular, responding to calls. If she goes into someone's house and she goes, oh my gosh, I'm, I know this person, I've been here, I was here last week or whatever, this is what the problem is, or they might benefit from community paramedicine, she can refer that person to this program. So it's within our own services, we've gotten a lot of people that way. Um, we've also looked at people that um, frequently activate the system and really, honestly, just track them down. There's sometimes we just have knocked at people's doors, and okay. honestly, people, come on in. Like it's it's well, been amazing. amazing. Like how we're receptive yeah. people are. People are very yeah. receptive. Um, we've gotten, like I said, uh, working with a doctor over at the at uh, Centre de Santé, the the Francophone Community Health Centre. Uh, we get patients from him, we monitor, we always provide that, you know, we provide him with those assessments. Um, uh, where else? Uh, act, uh, oh, the hospital, community um, hospital here in Cornwall. Um, the discharge nurses and uh, the geriatric nurses, they, they send referrals over to us. We follow up with people then because in that window, people are quite vulnerable when they're they're discharged and they're making that transition home. Mm. Um, a lot of people they're very susceptible to um, being readmitted, and that's another thing. One of our goals of the program is to make that transition home successful, and so we follow up with people after they leave the hospital, uh, making sure that you know are they getting their medications, um, their prescribed medications filled. A lot of people don't because they return home and they have no way to get to the pharmacy. So they just don't, they don't get their new prescription. Um, uh, we get referrals from mental health at the hospital, um, the crisis team. Uh, and then we're also now uh, started working a lot with uh, care for and their elder. Yeah, yeah. They have a home program. Yeah, so oftentimes, okay. Yeah, so they're going home. Um, and uh, whether or not those people are um, part of their elder abuse uh, program or um, you know other clients of theirs that they think um, our program would kind of complement their services, we're getting referrals from them as well. So um, there's a there's a lot of different sources, and that also means a lot of different type of clients as well. So um, I can see I can see that all. Uh, I know a guy today, he's being operated on in Ottawa as we speak. And then uh, when he wakes up around 3, uh, the Red Cross will be bringing him home. Mm -hmm. And when he gets home, he's up by himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, he perfect no example. relatives to be there with him. And, uh, you know, it just, uh, you think about it, and it, it must be so frightening for mm -hmm. somebody like that. And you're all groggy after, about, mm -hmm. you know, an anesthetic anyway. And then there's chances of falls and, falls and everything. Yes, exactly. like, uh, That's what I was thinking. And then what that bring, uh, what will that bring on? You know? yeah. A broken bone or yeah, a lot of work to do out there. <laughs> I think it's just wonderful. Uh, and there are, you know, there are a lot of people with with very little support, and 
little to no family around and it's really those people that they might have a few people at arm's length away at arm's reach away but no no constant kind of care or check-in or anything no. like that so no. um you know, and we kind of gauge, you know, the needs of these people, you know, how often they should be seen. So there's some people we see twice a week. Uh, a lot of people we see on a weekly basis. And then some who are a little bit more independent or who are progressively getting better, we might check in on them every two or three weeks just to make sure that they're okay. And, you know, if their has been a problem, at least they can bring that forward and, and they know someone is going to be coming. So. Um, so um, my last question would be, uh, where are you going to get these paramedics from? Um, you won't be so busy uh, in answering all the 911 calls. You can we're dedicated. already have your own team yeah, to do we're, this. Uh, we're dedicated to, yeah. Oh, that's good. We get in the assigned, uh, we get our, kind of our docket at the beginning of oh, the show. So they... And we visit uh, the clients. Oh. And yeah, we're... Uh, we're not considered on the road, although we're still paramedics and we can still act in that in that role. If, if I come in, in into somebody's home and find that uh, there is something that's acute, uh, mm -hmm. there is, I, I will put my paramedic hat on. My responding, I, I will contact our dispatch and I'll have an ambulance dispatched and, oh. and so deal, with them, deal with them. Too, right? Yeah, deal with them uh, that way. You can deal with it immediately, and then yeah. they wait for the ambulance. As an emergency, yeah. So as, as a true emergency, yeah. for sure. No, they, we, we, we have a selected group of these guys. We did it internally, so we didn't, you know, hire anyone new or anything. And yeah. there were people who applied for this position, so it's a team of paramedics that want to be in this role. So they just rotated and out. And so, you know, Pascal's in the community role today um, for a few days this week, you know. There's Randy will be on it in... in uh, on next okay. week, but you know, later today he's on the road, so they're okay. switching in and out. Yeah, so there's uh, a total of nine of them. Mm -hmm. That's fine. All the emergency I can to promote it <laughs> because uh, as a nurse, I can see really, really good uh, prevention, health prevention, and that's got to be the key to you mm -hmm. know keeping people out of our hospital so much too. Yeah, exactly. Keep them for true emergencies. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. stops, yeah.